I'm Jeff Fritz with soundstage.com, and I'm joined today by Carl Heinz Fink. He is the founder of both Fink Audio Consulting and Fink Team. And the difference between those two companies, Fink Audio Consulting, uh, in that role, Carl is a loudspeaker designer. Uh, he works for various other loudspeaker manufacturers. And with Fink Team, that is a commercial brand uh, with several loudspeakers, commercial loudspeakers, very highly regarded loudspeakers, I should say, that are available uh, to the consumer. Carl, how are you today? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, thank you. So it's already four o'clock. The day is almost gone. The weather is <laughs> nice. It's not too hot. So it's nice. <laughs> Everything is okay. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you joining me today. And the reason that I wanted to have you on is, uh, you know, when we were in Munich at High End back earlier in the year, you introduced the Epos brand and uh, not only the Epos brand, but your first Epos loudspeaker that you designed. Before we get into that particular loudspeaker, though, I want to hear a little bit about why you acquired Epos. I think that was in around 2020. And uh, just give us a little bit of the backstory. Sure. I mean, we started some years ago with Think Team. Um, so the Think Team story is that um, we had an internal loudspeaker that we used for internal development. Uh, and one of our friends, the late Ken Shiwata, um, asked us to, to make those loudspeakers in a nicer cabinet uh, to introduce his new amplifier and CD player combination. Um, and we did that. And um, the success was really phenomenal. I mean, we got so many uh, people asking for it that we decided, we said, okay, we make this as a as a yeah, available loudspeaker. And that was when we started with Think Team. Um, all the loudspeakers here that we do under the brand Think Teams are made here we we do a lot of things that you normally wouldn't expect because i mean we really make them as perfect as possible but it got his price so at the end of the day these are expensive loudspeakers and there was always the idea to have something where we could be a little bit on the more affordable side not saying cheap but affordable side and then one day I spoke with uh, Mike Creek, and then we had the idea, hey, why you don't take over EPOS? Um, you know, I know EPOS from, from the beginning. I, I have worked with Robin Marshall, the original founder. I think we did something together the first time for Mission in England. And later on, we designed something for Infinity, actually, that when he was working there. So, and, and we also worked a lot for Morton Short at that time. So there was a history with this brand. Uh, and I was always, yeah, I always liked what he did. So it was not the typical mainstream. I do it like all the other do it. So the typical British monitor style. Um, and then, yeah, so we, we discussed how to do it. And then we found the price. Uh, and then actually we did the deal. Um, after we announced that, I was very much shocked to get so much reaction. So many, many people from all over the world did contact us and said, hey, I had one, I had an ES12, I had 11, I had 14. Um, so good to see that somebody is taking you know, the brand and trying to do something. So there's a huge, uh, you know, really big fan community um, and then of course yeah we said okay this is something that we have to take very very serious because this is not just a brand that you can put on a product we have to do something special and that's when we started well and you know when we were in munich you know and when i walked in the room and i saw that the epos brand and that you were associated with it you know the the, the first thing that came to mind you know you've you've got uh, and, and back to the Fink team for a second, you know, you have the Kim loudspeaker, you have the Borg loudspeaker, they're two way designs, uh, but they sound really big. And, you know, they just, they're, they're, they're room filling designs when you hear those loudspeakers. And I've heard those loudspeakers, you know, in Munich and in various places. 
So when I saw the first EPOS loudspeaker, the ES14N, I guess I wasn't surprised that it was a large loudspeaker for a two-way stand mount. Uh, but when I heard the sound, especially at the price, I was just blown away. It's not just so the soundstage readers and our YouTube channel viewers know. This is a two-way loudspeaker, but it's not a little tiny uh, two-way that images great but has no bass. That's not what you set out to design. And that's not what you ended up with. This is a substantial loudspeaker that sounds big. It fills a room. It just has these these great qualities of a floor standard while also having, uh, you know, terrific sound staging uh, properties as well. So I was super impressed by that loudspeaker. And I want to hear a bit a little bit about the design of ES14N. Why did you choose that form factor? and give us give us some of the secrets on on how you got such great sound um, i mean you know when we started we we thought about what is the first model we should do and of course it had to be the es14 because that was the first model actually that got really a lot of followers and still many people think it's a great loudspeaker um, and that gave us the form factor so we said okay this is a slightly larger bookshelf uh, and in fact, the, the cabinet volume of the old one and the new one are almost the same. So, um, and that was, you know, this classic almost eight inch two way thing is really, really a, a nice combination. And in the past, we had a lot of very good loudspeaker with this combination. So it's just the right compromise between size and drive unit size and how to do the mid band. Um, and so it was clear it must be an ES14 that we are trying. Um, I mean, of course, everybody was expecting that we do the same thing that Robin Marshall did. So, you know, ah, you know, this is a retro loudspeaker. Like our friends from Mission, they made this famous Mission thing and they tried to copy it as good as possible. That was not my intention. Um, my intention was to catch the spirit and what they did uh, in, in 83 when they started with the loudspeaker. Um, you know, use, try to use what they have used, but of course, on the other hand, add all the improvements that we learned in this almost 40 years now. You know, we didn't sit somewhere in the corner doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you're laughing, but you know, uh, when people came in Munich into the room and said, oh, that doesn't look like an ES-14, we said, yeah, there's a reason for that. Um, and But we tried really hard, you know, to get a lot of things into the loudspeaker that Romy Marshall originally did. Um, but not everything, you know, we use. So um, I think the most difficult for the hardcore um, EPOS fans is the fact that there's more than one component in the crossover. Um, and, but I, you know, I can explain that that is not just, you know, because we don't know how to use one component. Uh, but again, we learned a lot of things over the years. Um, and was it difficult in the past that there was an interaction between the drive unit and the crossover? Now we know how to optimize the drive unit so they don't have this interaction. And on the other hand, you know, the music 40 years ago was completely different. So that was before CD. And, um, you know, when we're trying, we're trying hard to make really good alignments for the, for the woofer in a ported design. The original one was, I mean, there was a port in, but I'm not sure that this was really a, you know, a standard ported design because there's almost no output coming from the ports. But hey, you know, that was a loudspeaker that was really had a get really good comments, got good comments uh, in that time. And yeah, we we at least try to to take over as much as possible as, for example, the drive unit. Um, before I really looked into the ES14, I did some calculations. What drive unit size should I take? Um, and I don't want it to be, you know, locked to the traditional ones so you know because we design the drive units from scratch so it doesn't matter if they are five and a half five three quarters six six and a half whatever uh, so we ended up with seven inch so it got you know the best of 
eight inch and six and a half inch, the best of two worlds. Um, and funny enough, when I measured the, the original one, it was also seven inch. So we came more or less uh, to the same result if it comes down to dry feeling size. And Robin used metal domes. Um, I think metal domes are not very popular nowadays. I think there are some beryllium and things like that. Um, and I haven't used a metal dome for many, many years. And I said, okay, metal dome, I understand why people like metal domes, but they have to be better um, nowadays. And, and we have the possibility to make them better because we have a lot of really powerful tools for simulation um, that makes it easy to do a lot of iterations and to find a better solution um, than, you know, the old metal domes that always sounded a little bit, uh, you know, fizzy and, and, and really not, not very nice. Um, we also tried very, very hard to do a first order crossover. And the reason why the cabinet is tilted, I was coming from that. Um, I mean, a first order crossover in theory, many people tell me, ah, you know, they have the best behavior, there's no face problem, uh, no group delay, and God knows what else. Yeah? But that's not really true, because the drive unit itself is already a bump pass, so a high pass, and then later on it rolls off. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, the result that you listen to is the combination of the acoustic behavior and the electrical filter. So whatever you put on on your uh, on your on your tweeter will end up in a third order, second order, high pass mechanical one, and then first order uh, crossover. And then your your face behavior is bye bye, so that it behaves like any other um, third order. Um, filter. Um, but I said, okay, let's try to make a really nice, really flat slope. Um, the original one was pretty much, I would say, second order liquids Riley. So, you know, everything that I measured was almost in that area. Um, but, you know, you should have the, the, the time alignment between the woofer and the tweeter. And, you know, the, the woofer is that deep and the tweeter is flat, there is something. So how can we uh, solve that? You can make a step into your front baffle or you could just tilt it. Uh, that's what we tried. And I don't know how many versions with simple all the crossovers we did. But at the end, we said, no, that's not us. And then we decided to leave the, the tilted cabinet because we thought it looked nice. And of course, it makes sense when there's some alignment. Um, and that's why we have the cabinet as we have it now. Um, you see on the on the front, you you also see um, a, a, yeah, a front baffle. So the black one with the rounded corners with the radius on. Uh, this came also after we tried uh, to make a good crossover with a, with a traditional square cabinet. But you know, we have this diffraction effects on the corners, whatever you do. Um, and they, you know, they, they are in the area of the crossover and it's really, really difficult. And that's not really something that you can do with measurement to tell you, oh, you go here and there, or you make a little bit less or more energy. And I said, do I want that? No, because I mean, EPOS was always about having technical solutions to help getting a better sound. So we tried then a chamfer, you know, 45 degrees, just to find out that it really didn't help. Um, and then we made a radius and hey, it improved a lot. And so we decided then to, to, to leave it with that. So it was is very much then doing something that makes technical wise sense and not so much lifestyle. Um, I mean, the, the woofer itself, I don't know, I mean, how much technical details you really want to hear. So are you okay with that? Yes, well, and, and, and I want to just interject one thing, because I think you, you mentioned 
you know, the retro loudspeakers. And certainly we've seen a lot of, you know, the introduction of, of retro styled loudspeakers. I think from a, the consumer standpoint, at least from my, from my perspective, being a consumer myself, you know, the retro is more about the look of the product, but the modern engineering, I can't imagine any consumer rejecting the idea of the modern engineering in the retro styled product. And so what you're describing in terms of all of the technical improvements in the ES14N versus, you know, an older loudspeaker, an older EPOS loudspeaker, I think that that's, uh, you know, from my perspective, that's what you would want when you buy the, the, the new product. You want the new engineering, you want the better performance with all the measurement capabilities and all the things like you mentioned that you learned in, 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 in the past 40 years designing loudspeakers. So, uh, you know, what you're saying makes absolute sense in terms of having a product that's thoroughly up to date from a technical standpoint, but then has some of the retro, some of the feeling, some of the spirit if you will, of the older product. Is that about right? Yes. And of course, it's part of my own personality that I like to do things in a different way. So, you know, I mean, polypropylene, for example, is was the, the cone that we wanted to use. Uh, but I know that at least here in Europe, polypropylene is not that popular. Um, and that's because polypropylene was really sounding really tired and, and, and slow. Um, but that, that wasn't the fault of polypropylene. Um, but in the same period of time, we had this very high damping, uh, you know, surround material that was the kind of mixture between PVC and rubber. Um, this came originally, I think, from the BBC. You know, when you had the surrounds, maybe you have seen them on some of the classic monitors you push in um, the surround, and then you wait 21, 22, 23, <laughs> before it comes out. And that's exactly when you listen uh, to music with it, you know. Um, those loudspeakers measures wonderful. It really makes this, you know, this what we call the first mode when they start the outer part is starting to waving a little bit. It makes it really flat, and it makes it really nice. The problem was that it has so much hysteresis that it eats up all the nice things in the music. And um, we said, okay, let's go for polypropylene, but we make it in a way that, that it sounds, you know, as dynamic as a paper cone, but has a nice clean mid band of a polypropylene. Uh, and that's why we did, um, why, why we did a polypropylene. And, and I'm really, really happy with the result. I mean, it's really nice sounding material. Um, we decided to go for injection molded. And the reason is that, you know, the traditional polypropylene is made with a film. You buy a film and then you uh, suck it in and then you cut it and your, um, your cone is done. Um, there are not so many different materials around. Um, and with injection molding, you can use whatever is on the market. Uh, and so we, the first cone that we did, actually we did two, um, was trying to follow this really nice roll off thing, you know, with, with very little crossover, um, but it didn't sound very well. So, I mean, I really didn't like it. It had a sort of quackiness in the mid band and that was due to the shape. So we made a second one. But we could, you know, make, you know, the, the inner part has a slightly different thickness when it comes to the voice call bobbin. And so you can do a lot of detail work that you can't really do by just uh, having, uh, you know, 0.3 millimeter thick polypropylene foil like the traditional one. So it was sort of, you know, kind of nice exercise for us from the engineering point of view. Um, and we ended also up with a with a face plug like the original one. Um, well, that was not because we wanted to follow the original one, but it was just the best result best result that we could get. Um, and coming back to the crossover thing, why drivers are better nowadays? Um, when you when you when you see a drive unit and you have the crossover on the other side, you think, ah, the, the crossover sees you know, the impedance of the loudspeaker, 
and then you design your filter and everybody is happy and they play together. Hmm. The problem is that the, that the impedance, that the part that the crossover sees, is changing when it's moving. Um, because, I mean, you have a coil that is sitting in a, in a piece of metal and it goes in, there's more metal in, the impedance goes up um, and it goes out, it goes down. So there's always a kind of modulation uh, of your crossover. Um, and that is why, why some designs with complex crossovers are really not working well, because depending on your, how you do it, uh, you end up with some nasty things in the midband due to these variations. And um, nowadays, after almost, I don't know, 20 years of Clipper, so we all learned how to uh, make this more linear. This was not specially designed for the, for the crossover, uh, but it was, you know, done to have other effects, or to reduce other effects. So with a nicely compensated loudspeaker uh, magnet, you don't have to be scared that your crossover is doing something bad. Um, and that's why we then did um, a more complex crossover. Um, the tweeter is, is metal, as I said, um, and we use kind of ceramic coating. Um, I think this is not really new. Um, I think other companies did that. I know that um, Harman did that for God knows how many years and, and other companies. Uh, it just, you know, makes it more stiff. And you have on the metal, you have this peak, you know, what we call the first thing uh, that you really have. And in the old days, we just hit 20 kilohertz and then we could shift it a little bit um, further up. Um, so the first version was an aluminum uh, alloy. We had it at around 25 kilohertz. Um, but we wanted to have it higher. So we tried with the ceramic and we could shift it higher. Um, and then we tried even harder by doing a lot of simulations and we ended up with a kind of coupler ring um, that is sitting on top of the voice call former. Um, and that actually brought the peak up to 30 kilohertz. Um, so that's quite high. And we didn't use any exotic materials like beryllium or diamonds or whatever. Um, what we also did, um, we added a filter to this area because you would say, hey, you know, 30 kilohertz, that's far away from what we can hear. Um, why, are you, why are you worried about that? I said, well, there are something like intermodulation and um, you never know what with modern digital material, you know, source material is, is, is coming out of your amplifier. So you have noise shaping, you have all sorts of things. And I said, do I want to radiate really 30 kilohertz uh, into the room? Um, and then we, I mean, I did some experiments and we found a nice way of filtering it out with a notch only on this frequency. And we tried it here with, with, with people and, and almost everybody could hear the difference. Even so, it was at 30 kilohertz and there was nothing happened, you know, at lower frequency. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, different things from, uh, from how, how it was done in the past. Um, yeah, using... So, Carl, yeah, let, let me ask you this, and, and, and certainly you've gone into great detail about the technical design. I think you've answered a lot of questions that people would have. But when you listen to the, the ES14N, what, what do you hear? You know, when, when, you, when you were done with the design and you set the loudspeaker up and you were listening to the loudspeakers yourself, what, what, what was your impression of the sound quality you had achieved? The difference between hi-fi and high-end is how often you can start from scratch. Um, so that means, you know, you, the, the, the progress you do over time. So, you know, you make your first crossover, you listen to it, you say, yeah, it's okay, and you like it in a way, and then after a while you say, oh, maybe I could this one and this one and this one. And then it might be that you start from scratch, 
like we did with our first order, a very simple crossover. So um, the more high end you go, the more time you need to go always one step and you need to have the freedom to say, stop and do something new because I think we can get more out. Um, I'm personally not the guy who is, you know, always looking for resolution. There's nothing wrong with resolution, but I'm more, you know, probably like name was doing it for the emotion and the music. So, I mean, I have worked many years for name and, and, you know, even so they paid me um, money. I sometimes I thought maybe I should have paid them money. Uh, because yeah, I learned a lot about pace, rhythm, and timing. And and Roy George, the technical director, was is, is still a good friend. And and so you know they he taught me how this emotional part um, is the important bit. You know you can have loud speakers where you hear some pling pling. You know twenty five meters in the room, and you can identify you know whether he plings it on the left or on the right part of the triangle. But hey, who cares, you know? When I listen to music, it's the emotional part that, that hits me or not. Um, and so that is exactly what we do when we, when we listen to the loudspeaker and do the voicing. So it's not here, it's more here uh, where it has to go. Um, and then to, you know, to translate what you feel into something that your brain then can put into the, the product is the difficult bit. Um, but it's, I can't really, I can't really say, you know, technical wise, we do this and this and this and this. Yeah, we do a lot, but all of it we do to start in a, in a better way with the listening. Because the last bit and the most important one is done by listening and not by measurement. So you're happy with the sound? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, I can have every loudspeaker I want in my listening room. Um, and right now, most of the time I'm listening to the to the earphones. Yeah, well, after listening to the speaker in Munich, I can I can definitely see why. And and just so that that people know as well, you know, when we're we're talking about a more affordable loudspeaker, we're not talking about a super cheap loudspeaker. I think in in Europe, uh, generally it was introduced at around forty five hundred euro per pair. Is that is that still correct? Yep. Yeah. So yeah last... that... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, it's okay. So. So the last question that I have, Carl, is really, you know, you've 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 had a great debut with the ES 14 in. I can imagine that that loudspeaker is going to sell well for years. And, uh, you know, I really can't wait, honestly, to hear a pair myself in my room because, you know, it was just such an impressive debut in Munich. But, you know, the next question or last question is what what else can we expect from EPOS? What are you going to do with the brand, you know, say over the next year or two? What what's coming? Um, so, you know, our first planning is three models. Um, I mean, there will be a floor stander, um, you know, with the same driver size, but with a second woofer. Um, so that's the logic thing that, you know, you make something that goes in larger rooms and uh, has a similar form factor, but a second woofer. Um, and there will be a smaller one. So um, the smaller one, I'm, I'm doing some simulations and calculations. Um, so, you know, something eight, eight and a half liter. Um, because I like smaller loudspeakers in a way to make them sound nice. Um, and you just need something that you can use in smaller apartments or in smaller rooms. Um, so we will have the floor stander and the smaller one. Okay. Um, the smaller one is quite interesting because. Um, I mean, I have done so many small loudspeakers in, 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 in the past, so normally I should easily know how to do it. Uh, and in effect, you know, you know what, they are, what, what you can use. Uh, but I want to do something special, something different. Um, let's see. But this is then the next one, probably the, the smaller one. Okay, um, okay. 
Well, that sounds terrific. And, you know, I think uh, fans of ePost loudspeakers, you mentioned, you know, when you bought the company that there's, you know, there's a, really an outpouring of prior owners and, 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 you know, people that have been familiar with ePost through the years. And I'm sure, you know, with this announcement of the new loudspeakers and, and you know, with some technical detail on the ES14N, it's only going to serve uh, to grow the brand further and really really let people know that EPOS is back and, and, and stronger than ever in terms of the quality of the products that, that are available. Well, Carl, listen, I really do appreciate your time today, and I wish you the best of luck with EPOS, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing an ES14 in pretty soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.